the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's always a great joy to celebrate this feast of Saint Seraphim. And it's a great joy, of course, when we have people coming from so far and about to travel back so far on this wonderful feast. If we look at the life of Saint Seraphim, who would have thought that not only the Russian Orthodox people, but the whole Orthodox world, and Christians well beyond the Orthodox world, could be so captivated with the memory of a figure like Saint Seraphim. Not because his life isn't worth remembering, quite the contrary, but because we think of such quiet and obscure and humble origins in the backwaters of pre-revolutionary Russia. There have probably been others like Saint Seraphim who lived lives of great holiness, who achieved the great spiritual heights, but haven't been remembered like him. Perhaps some of them have even been forgotten. But in the case of Saint Seraphim, of course, we're indebted to his spiritual children who preserved his memory. And one other thing, of course, his intercession for the birth of the Martyr Tsarevich Alexei. Who would have thought this man, born in Kursk, from a merchant class of an ordinary life, who lived a life of such simplicity and poverty in a cassock of canvas, could be such an aristocrat, such a great boyar in the spiritual world. Because that's what he is. He is a spiritual giant. And I wonder if we asked at least Russians to name the saints, not that we should be putting saints in rank. I wonder after Saint Nicholas, whether Saint Seraphim would be there at the top. If we asked most Russian Orthodox people for their favourite Russian saint, I think we would probably nearly always find Saint Seraphim at the top. For us, we'd say he needs to hold hands with Saint John Maximovich at the top, because characters who are in some ways so very similar. But if we look at the life of Saint Seraphim, it can bring us answers and it can be an antidote. And this is what I want us to briefly think about now. Now, St. Seraphim as an antidote to everything that the world tries to pump into us now. We turn on the television and we see a whole culture of ostentation, of self-promotion, of ego, of reputation. We see advertisements for seminars and for courses for you to go on to learn, to project yourself, to show how successful you are, how talented you are, how employable you are, how profitable you are, what a great investment you might be for somebody else. And we are taught to stand tall and to put our heads high and to be bloated by pride. This is the way of the world now. And this isn't just the musings of a grumpy priest. It's what we see. You see it. We see some of these awful sort of re pseudo reality programs on the television. And they're full of ego. And they're full of me, 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 me. Look at me, look at me. Over here. What about me? And then we come to Saint Seraphim. And two words press themselves against us with great force. The one is humility and the other is meekness. Very often we confuse them. What's the difference between humility and meekness? But certainly in the English language, this word humility, smirenia, this is really not about our interaction with everybody else. It's about the way we are. 
It's about the way we see ourselves. It's about the way we consider ourselves. The way we see ourselves in relationship with God. This humility is something through which we see our poverty, through which we see our brokenness, in which we acknowledge that we are dust, that we're dust that has been given the spark of life and the breath of God. In this humility, which St. Seraphim really represents, if we have it in our lives, there's no possibility of us being puffed up and egotistical. Rather, we will look at ourselves after we have first looked at God. After we've first seen the greatness and the glory and the majesty of God. Everything about God which is immeasurable, which is indescribable, which is beyond our weak and feeble human intellect. We look, and in time and in space, we see the incarnation of the Son of God, of God the Son himself, God become flesh for us. We see that he himself showed great humility, that God the Son wouldn't even take the attention, so, ten, attention away from God the Father, so that he was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Christ who attributed everything to the Father. And even though he was God, didn't say, look at me. Even though he was God, did not impose <coughs> himself and push himself and seek the attention of others. But rather showed that quietness, that self-restraint, that spiritual sobriety, that simplicity, that are all parts of humility. And that humility in action is translated into meekness. This meekness. Humility and meekness today are seen as weaknesses. Other people will look and say, Oh, she's so humble, he's so meek. As a sarcastic comment. Humility and meekness are seen as signs of failure, are seen as signs of weakness. Of the fact that you're not the person to employ that you're not the person to have as somebody else's partner in business or whatever venture. And yet meekness, which is our humble relationship with others, shows what? That we follow Christ, that we put others first, that we put our needs behind the needs of everybody else, that we think first of the needs of our neighbour, and our love for our neighbour is translated into this disinterested meekness. This shines through the life of Saint Seraphim. If you think of the times in his life when he showed such great humility and great meekness, to be almost beaten to death by three men, after he's seen them coming, and what does he do? He's, he has that little axe that we see him leaning on and using as a walking stick. What does he do? He throws the axe, he throws the weapon to the side. And he doesn't meet their violence with violence. He follows the examples of those that will very shortly celebrate St. Buddies and St. Gleb. He shows meekness in the face <coughs> of violence. He rather says, here I am, do what you must. He will not fight evil with evil. He would rather be a victim. When those men were caught and went to trial, you probably remember from the life of Saint Seraphim, he doesn't go to give all the evidence to say, yes, and they did this, and they did this, and they hit me, and, and they did this, and they, they kicked me, and they swore, and go into details. No. He pleads before the judge for clemency, for mercy, for these men who gave him injuries which resulted in that hunched way that we see him in many of his icons. Physically life-changing injuries. <coughs> and he still pled, pleaded for mercy on the part of those that had done this. How different that
that is to the way we often are. Tit for tat, spitefulness, pettiness. We remember the wrongs often from when we're children. We remember cruel things that were said to us by other children. They may perhaps remember cruel things that we said to them. We remember the teacher at school who was horrible to us, who picked on us, who humiliated us. We go around with all of this baggage and then we come back to the life of Saint Seraphim who won't even accuse somebody else and judge somebody else in the present after they've left him for dead in the very near past. How much can we learn from this? It's not to say that we should go looking to be met with violence, that we should go looking to be met with cruelty, but it's saying that we should look on the world and our neighbours in a different way. And that's the point. These three men who beat this monk to within an inch of his life, in his mind, were his brothers. They were his neighbours. He wouldn't judge them. Why? Because he was so aware of his own self that he wouldn't put himself above these men who had even done just such a terrible thing. How easy it would be. We would look down on these people straight away. We would condemn them straight away. But St. Seraphim wouldn't even judge them. He wouldn't condemn them. He didn't want anybody else to condemn them. This is the gentleness, together with the humility and the meekness that shines through this life. And we are called to this also. Before the creed, of course, we sing, let us love one another, that with one mind we may confess. And we often forget where that love needs to be going. The love isn't always to the obvious places, to mum, to dad, to sister, to brother, to granny, to granddad, to best friend. The love, when we say let us love one another, means that we are going to be loving or trying to love people who do not love us. That we are perhaps trying to love people that hate us, that people want our, our own destruction, people who are jealous of us, people who want what we've got, and people who will do things to damage us. And yet we're still called, even in that was in Trudruna, to reach out to all of these people. That's what we see in this life of Saint Seraphim. And then we think of other characteristics. We see his prayer. You or I are not probably very likely to be kneeling on a stone for a thousand nights, days and nights. And yet we are still called to prayer by this wonderful example of Saint Seraphim. Whether he was praying in the forest or praying in his hermitage. This prayerfulness is our calling. It's not just the call of monks and nuns. Um, and nuns. He was a podvizhnik. He was an ascetic. Every one of us is called to be an ascetic. If you don't want to be an ascetic, tough luck. It's the call of your baptism is to be an ascetic. The call of your baptism is to fast. The call of your baptism is above all things to pray because these are the ways by which St. Seraphim reminds us we acquire the Holy Spirit. These are the ways into that deeper spiritual life. The consolation that comes from God. The grace that comes from God. That makes it possible to cheerfully put up with life-changing injuries that make an old man stoop and humped and in pain. Remember, he was an injured man recovering from horrendous injuries when his knees went down on that rock and he prayed and prayed and prayed. A man in pain, but praying. Why? Because the consolation, the grace of God made him forget all of the other things. We all have things in our lives that are painful and broken 
and that deeply affect us. And yet, the call of this life of St. Seraphim is to move into prayer, move into that experience of God, move into the divine. It doesn't take the other things away, but it transforms the way in which we can see them. In St. Seraphim, we see no gloomy asceticism, that sort of self-flagellating asceticism that we associate with the Latin West. There's no gloom, there's no misery, there's only joy. If we say, Repetobi Seraphim, most people will think perhaps of two phrases. It could be one of those psychological tests. I say something, what's your answer? And very often if people say, I think of two phrases. You're thinking of them already. Radost moja and Christos vos These are the things that shine through. And these are the things which must shine through our lives. My joy and Christ is risen. Because despite everything in our lives, St. Seraphim leads us into the Paschal mystery. Beyond the cross, into the empty tomb and out of the empty tomb again where we realise and know that Christ is risen. Not that Christ has risen, that Christ is risen. And I hope that we can all remind ourselves of St. Seraphim's life. Go away. Read his life if we need to refresh our memories. Pray the Akathis, which is full of biographical detail. And go there and see all of these things. To find this humility, to find this meekness, this acceptance of things that happen in life, that we don't always like, that we don't always want to do. Come back from your hermitage, come back to the monastery now. Answer, bless, I will come and do what I'm asked. Let us go looking for this great simplicity of his life, in which we have what we need, not what we want. In which we take what we need, not what we want. In which we consume what we need, not simply what we want. And let us go away and find hope in St. Seraphim. Because this morning, after a very, very difficult week, with great trials, it seemed that St. Seraphim said, look here, True hope sees the kingdom of God and is sure that everything necessary for this mortal life will be given. The heart cannot have peace until it acquires this hope. This hope pacifies it fully and brings joy to it. The most holy lips of the Saviour spoke of this very hope. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let St. Seraphim and his life lead us into hope, because ultimately that is the message of the resurrection which shone through St. Seraphim's life. So let's follow him. Let each of us have encouragement from him, and let's be joyful with him in the hope of the resurrection and the mercy and the love of God, which shines and which truly did shine with the light of Tabor through the life of this holy and righteous giant. May St. Seraphim pray for us and send us his help from on high. Christos was crazy.